Check out that horse. What a stud, literally. A DNA test could prove a relationship between this stallion and his colt over there, but you never know it to watch them. Neither of them cares either way. How about this big guy? He might have provided the genetic material for that calf or maybe that steer, but again, what difference does it make? Then there's this little guy. He's got a father, of course, but he hopes you never meets him. His own father is his biggest threat. Providing half of the genetic material for the next generation may technically qualify one as a father, and so studs, sires, and even boars meet that minimal criteria, but men aren't beasts. When it comes to humanity, fatherhood is about more than just having kids somewhere who carry your DNA. Fatherhood is about much, much more. I'm Joel Bierman. I'm a professor, a pastor, a husband, and a father. They are all important aspects of who I am, of my identity, but in this Bible study from the Men's Network, we're going to focus on the last of them and consider this thing called fatherhood. And fathers come in all shapes, sizes, and very widely in quality. You may be a father, a grandfather, or a future father. In this study, we're going to talk about that significant role, what we do, why it's important, and what happens when we fall short, and we do all fall short. Well, to start, I want to talk about fatherhood as a vocation. Vocation, remember, is not what you do, but more it's really who you are. It comes from a Latin word that means literally to call. Vocation fundamentally has to do with our basic relationships. Much more than just the kind of work you do to earn a living, the most fundamental, most important vocations are callings. The ones that start at home, son, husband, father. Now, God gave you the responsibility of being a father. It's a God-given task, a holy task, a vocation. Whatever your career, whether teacher, engineer, factory worker, farmer, or pastor, you need to realize that the vocation of fatherhood is a critical part of what God has put you here to do. When you invest in being a father, when you invest in the work of raising children, caring for them, providing for them, teaching them, this is holy work. It is work from God himself and it is pleasing to God. You don't have to run down to the church to do something holy. You just do what God has given you to do, including fatherhood. Now there's a stark contrast between seeing fatherhood as a vocation and the way that the world looks at fatherhood. Are you an idiot? Do you want your children to see their father bouncing down the highway? What you... Quick, shoot him, Chris! What are you waiting for? I, I, how do I know which one to shoot? What? How do I know which one is the real dad? I, we, we never switch. Wait, wait, we don't even look the same. All right, when's my birthday? Ah, oh, crap. February eighth. Ah! Dad! And that's how you treat an acute poison ivy breakout. I'd like to apologize to you guys for letting you play in what I thought was Clover. And Jack, I wouldn't go number two for a few weeks if I were you. I think you used that Clover for toilet paper. Your mom's doing laundry, but she authorized me to say goodnight for her. So, by the power vested in me, I now pronounce you sweet dreams. Mwah. Kids all over town are bathing in tomato juice thanks to you. It was one lousy skunk and a harmless methane explosion. I get that. I do. But you also spent 20 years being known as a uh, yard and pool guy. And I think I remember you saying you wanted to be known for something more. You can do this, Dad. I, I know you can. And if you don't, I'll still love you, but you gotta try. Do not Kiss me on the lips. You stop saying stuff that makes me want to. It's remarkable that the attack has become so direct, so coordinated, so aggressive. This tearing down of fatherhood with the goal, it seems, of simply pulling fathers down, leveling them, getting a man out of his role as father of a family. 
Now, what do these clips teach us about fatherhood? Any one of them might seem harmless enough by itself, just, you know, a guy being kind of funny. But each one of these is actually part of a consistent message. And the impact that that message has on people, people in your own house, is enormous. Think about how they begin to view fatherhood based on what they see. Now, I know men have their peculiarities, and we are easy comedy targets, but there's something more sinister going on here. Think about how some of these programs depict the mom in the family. She's cool. She has her act together. Inevitably, she's the real brains in the family, the one who keeps things going, the one who comes along and cleans up the messes and the disasters made by dad. This has become standard, and we've become just familiar with it. We accept it. It's just the way it is around us. It could all be boiled down, really, to one thing. It's really just one aspect of the feminization of our culture. It's part, to put it kind of rudely, of the castration of man's authority in society. Now, should we be surprised? Not really. The problem can be traced all the way back, right to the curses after the fall in Genesis 3. You shall have pain in your childbearing. Your desire shall be for your husband. God told that to Eve. And the context indicates that it's not sexual desire that he has in mind here. The desire is part of the brokenness of creation. The desire is for the place of authority that God gave to the man. Our culture today is still fighting that same battle against the authority of men, the authority of the Father, but with more success than ever before. Our culture does not make it easy for men to be the kind of fathers that God calls them to be. They want to tear men down and not build them up. But there's another threat, and I think a much greater threat to our being a good father. And that threat comes from something the world calls individualism and self-fulfillment. Sounds good, but it's really just plain old selfishness. A man does what he wants to do. He ignores his wife. He ignores his kids. He thinks bringing home a paycheck is enough to be a father. Not really much of an improvement from a stud, a bull, or a boar. In our world, it seems the individual is king. And the world tells you, you've got the right to have time for yourself. You've got the right to have your afternoon to go play golf, to go fishing, to go mess around in the garage, or better yet, retreat to your man cave. Well, the bottom line is that to be fulfilled, you're told that you've got to be doing whatever it is that makes you happy. The idea of actually denying your agenda, your dreams, or your interests for the sake of your children or their interests, well, that's scorned by a world that teaches you to think only of yourself. God calls us to a much different way of thinking about life, thinking about fatherhood. It's not an intrusion. It's not a rival for your self-fulfillment. It is recognizing your fulfillment in doing what God gave you to do, your vocation. It's your reason for being. And so, guys, the challenge to us is very clear. We've got to learn to see fatherhood as a calling from God himself. And we have to take seriously this holy vocation and begin to fight against the forces which demean that holy vocation and want to tear it down. We must work to build it back up. When you do what God gives you to do, things work the way they were designed to work. And everyone benefits. Your wife, your kids, everyone benefits. You doing your vocation as a father. It's what your wife needs. It's what your children desperately need. It's what the church needs. And honestly, whether they know it or not, it's what the people in the world around you need. What the world needs is fathers who do their vocation as father, who love their children, care for their children, and lead and teach their children. It is time, it's time for fathers to take seriously the task that God has given them to do. This is serious business, guys, and a blessed and a wonderful business. What a joy, what a joy to be a father.